actually let me admit also everybody yeah um just a few more seconds so that everyone joins uh -huh. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, good afternoon, Chun Han Fang. Um, it is a pleasure to welcome you, everyone, to today's seminar, uh, which will be given by uh, Chun Han Fang. And I would like to invite uh, our scientific host, Alexei, to introduce our speaker. So please, Alexei. Yeah. Thanks, Dylan. So, uh, as Dylan announced, uh, Chun Han Fang. Uh, to talk to us today about interplay of flat electronic band with pulse band. Pulse. Alexei, we don't hear you well. Please come closer to the microphone. Okay, so as Dylan announced, uh, Chunan Feng will be talking today about interplay of flat electronic bands with Holstein uh, phonons. So Chunan is doing her PhD with Professor Richard Scalitar at the University of California in Davis. And her interests are centered about interacting and frustrated many body um, systems. So with this, um, let's welcome our speaker and Chunan, the, the screen is all yours. Okay, thanks Professor Andrew Nam. And good morning everyone. My name is Chun Han Feng. I'm a first year PhD student at Department of Physics, University of California, Davis. And my advisor is Professor Richard Skeletor. Today, my topic is uh, interplay of light electronic bands with host and phonons. And this is the outline of my today's talk. I will talk about background first, and then I will introduce the Liblites and also the host model to you. And finally, I will talk about the method I used in this project and show you the results given by mean field theory and determinant quantum Monte Carlo method. Okay, let's start from the background. So uh, as we know in general, uh, energy usually depends on momentum. For example, for free formulas, we know the expression for the energy is h bar square over 2m times the sum of kx, y, z square. And another example is for a uh, tight bending model. We have ci dagger cj term. So like the electron is hopping and ij are the nearest neighbor here. And for example, for a square lattice, we know uh, we can do the Fourier transform and then solve the matrix. Um, we will find the energy band is given by negative 2t cosine kx plus cosine ky. And another example is for a uh, honeycomb lattice. So I write out the expression for honeycomb lattice. It looks a little bit more complicated, but we know the band structure is just like uh, we will have Dirac cones in the honeycomb lattice. So my point is that usually we know the energy always depends on momentum kx and ky, but it's really amazing that there are some periodic tight binding lattices containing flight bands. And there are many examples like Kagome lattice, uh, decorated honeycomb lattice, and the dice lattice. And both Professor Flach and Professor Andrew Nov have very nice papers about this topic, uh, talking about the design and implementations of light bands. So today I will focus on lead lattice, and the lattice structure is plotted on the left hand side. And uh, on the right hand side is the band structure. And we can see there is a flight band in the middle, which means here uh, E doesn't depend on Kx or Ky. Uh, in this case, E equals to zero, just uh, equal to some constants. That's what I mean by flight bands. And another point is that um, strong interactions usually make our life interesting. And people have some studies on electron-electron interactions in flight band system, including both repulsive and attractive um, interactions. And we know a repulsive one can give us ferromagnetic ground state. And today I will focus on electron phonon interaction which usually give rise to charge density waves in the lattice. And actually in the anti-adiabatic limit, 
um, the host model will become quantitatively equivalent with the attractive Hubbard model. But I want to emphasize that um, although they are become equivalent with each other in the anti-adiabatic limit, but since the host model break the spin symmetry uh, with CDW order dominating over superconductivity order, so that makes the CDW transition uh, happens at finite temperatures. And as a comparison, uh, Hubbard model, the transition only happens at T equals to zero. And another point is that when people talk about strong interactions, people means uh, when we look at the uh, interaction strongs, for example, in Hubbard model U divided by uh, band V W, and actually, if we have a flight band, that means W is equal to zero. So that means the interaction is super strong if we have a flight band. And all of this point uh, will make this project interesting. And I will show you some results soon. Okay, so now uh, I will introduce the host model to you. So basically we have three terms here. The first part is for the electrons. CI sigma dagger is a creation operator, which means we create an electron with spin sigma on site I. And CJ sigma is an annihilation operator, which means we remove an electron with spin sigma from site J. So this term is just like uh, the electron is hoping from site I to site J. And also it can go back from site J to site I. And here the second term mu is the chemical potential and CI, Diger CI is actually the density operator can be expressed as NI and we can change the values of chemical potential to control the density of the electron density of this system. And this is the second part of the uh, Hamiltonian for phonons. So we have phonon potential energy and also phonon kinetic energy. And omega naught here is just the phonon frequencies. And finally is the electron phonon interaction. So in Houston model for simplicity, we just uh, use a constant lambda to represent the electron phonon coupling strongs. And here XI is just the phonon displacement operator. And CI, Diger CI is uh, actually, again, just a density operator. And uh, in this project, we focus on the case when mu is equal to negative lambda square over omega naught square. And that gives us the half filling case due to the particle hole symmetry. OK, before we move on, let's look at several limiting cases. So first of all is when t equal to zero. So that means the original Hamiltonian will be divided into many single side host models, also at half filling if we cite mu equal to negative lambda square over omega naught square. And the single side host model can be expressed in this way. And then what we did here is just to complete the square. And then we can see actually we will have an, um, an up and an down term here. So the single side hosting model is actually an attractive electron electron interaction. And the uh, U effective is given by this value negative lambda square or omega naught square. We can also explore a little bit more about this. So for a single site, there are four possible states. It can be a uh, vacuum, no electrons there, or uh, double occupied. And if we view the last three terms as the potential energy for the system, and let's call it Vx, let's make a plot of Vx versus x. And we can see that when there is no electron, n equal to zero case, and when there are two electrons, n equal to two case, as is shown in the blue and the green curve here, the minimum of the potential energy is just uh, zero. But when there is uh, one electron per side uh, can be spin up or spin down, as is shown in this right curve here, when n equal to one, 
we can see the minimum of the potential energy is given by lambda square over two omega naught square. So uh, we know electrons prefer to stay in a lower potential energy. And it also gave us some feeling why uh, we will see a CDW pattern in this model. Some of the size are vacuum and some of the size are double occupied. Okay, so now uh, I will talk about the lip lattice to you. So we have three size per unit cell, site A, site B, and site C. And A1 and A2 are the basis vectors. Since we have three unit cells along both uh, A1 and A2 directions, we will define it as a three by three by three lattice. And we always use a uh, periodic boundary condition in the project. Okay, so now we come to another limiting case. It's one lambda equals to zero. So lambda equal to zero just means we won't have any electron phonon coupling term. So the last term just disappear and we only have electron pars and phonon pars and actually they are independent of each other. We can solve for them separately. And for the electron part, it's just a tight bending model. For the phonon part, it's just a quantum harmonic oscillator. And as we have discussed at the beginning of this talk, we know for the tight bending, tight bending model part, uh, we will have a flat band in this lip lattice. The band structure looks like this. And also another plot is also shown here, density of state as a function of energy. And we can see a delta function spike at E equal to zero also reflect this. So the question is very interesting. We want to study uh, what's the effect of this uh, flight band on the charge ordering. Okay, so now I will show you some results. Uh, the first part is given by mean field theory. So the first step we did is to use adiabatic approximation. So we can drop the PI squared term here. And we assume a staggered pattern of phonon displacement by using the unsized xi equal to x naught plus or minus delta. And if we plug this unsized into the Hamiltonian, we can see the Hamiltonian will be quadratic and can be diagonalized analytically. And then we can get the an expression for the free energy easily, which depends on X naught, delta, and the inverse temperature beta. Actually, uh, epsilon alpha here is the three forming energy bands and the ex expression of it is given here. Uh, so, and then we can notice that actually in the mean field host model, we will have a term lambda xi and i. And actually lambda xi can be viewed as a chemical potential acting on site i. So a non-zero bound demoralization delta also implies a staggered pattern of charge density. So we plot delta star as a function of temperature, and we determine delta star and x naught star by minimizing the free energy. And we can see that when T is larger than Tc around 1.9, the delta star is always almost at zero. So that means the charge density is uniform. There is no CDW phase. But when delta star is smaller than Tc, we can see uh, delta star is non-zero. Actually, we find there are a degenerate pair of solutions. Delta star can be either positive or negative. And by the way, just to want to remind you, the parameters we used for this plot is just the omega naught equal to one, the hopping t equal to one, and set mu equal to this value so that the system is at half feeding. And we did for a three by 40 by 40 uh, lattice size. And the lambda d is actually the dimensionless coupling constant, which is defined by lambda square over omega naught square times W, W is the bandwidth. 
So as I mentioned earlier, we have a degenerate pair of solutions. Delta star can be either positive or negative. It is actually corresponding to the fact that whether the minority sublattice A are occupied or majority sublattice B and C are occupied. So another way to look at this is by examining um, ele electron density as a function of temperature. And we can see uh, ST is larger than TC around 1.9, both density on sublattice A or density on sublattice BC, or the average on the whole lattice rho is equal to 0.5. This is because we set mu equal to negative lambda square over omega naught square. And due to the particle hole symmetry, it gives, it gives us uh, rho equal to 0.5 at high temperature. Uh, as temperature is lowered, we can see the density on sublattice A and the density on sublattice BC are different. If we take a more careful look, we can also notice that the right curves here, uh, so for sublattice B and C, is more uh, closer to a perfect CDW pattern. What I mean by perfect CDW pattern is, uh, is closer to rho equal to zero or rho equal to one stays. I think this is because uh, due to the lattice structure, we can see sublattice A has four nearest neighbors and the sublattice B or, or C only have two nearest neighbors. A perfect CDW pattern requires the absence of both thermal fluctuation and the quantum fluctuation. And if A have a larger number of nearest neighbors, it also means it has a larger number of hoppings so it's reasonable that will cause more quantum fluctuation. So that explains why the sublattice A is a little bit farther away from a perfect CDW pattern compared to uh, sublattice B and C. Okay, so finally, in, by using mean field theory results, we also pull out this electron density rho as a function of chemical potential, mu. And we can see that when T is larger, for example, here T equal to two at high temperature, the right curve is smooth, just to means uh, the system is transiting from a empty state to a fully occupied state. But as temperature is lowered, uh, let's look at this black curve here, when T equal to 0.1, we can see plateaus starts to develop at rho equal to one third and rho equal to two third, corresponding to the one third and two third CDW pattern. And we will also see such a similar phenomenon in the DQMC results. Okay, so now uh, let's turn to uh, quantum Monte Carlo method. And before I talk about the DQMC method I used in this project, I, will, I would like to briefly uh, talk a little bit about classical Monte Carlo. Uh, Monte Carlo methods are referred to as computer experiments since computers are generating configurations with desired probability distribution. And one example is that when people were doing classical statistical problems, the probability of being in state n with energy En is given by the Boltzmann distribution. Pn equals to one over z times e to the negative En over kBt. And here z is actually uh, just a partition function. And we will have a master equation. It describes the time evolution of probability density. So here P nu T is the probability of having configuration nu at time t. And w from sigma to nu is the probability per unit time for the system to go from configuration sigma to nu. So it means uh, if we consider how this p nu t changes uh, versus t, there are two ways. One is uh, currently the 
it is at configuration sigma, other configurations, and then it changes from sigma to new. So that increases the probability of configuration new. So that's why we have plus sign here. And another way is that currently the system is at configuration new. We have community and then the system changes from configuration new to sigma other configurations that decreases the probability uh, of configuration new. So that's why we have a minus sign here. And uh, in the stationary limit, I mean, when t tends to be infinity, we expect this value p nu t just to equal to some constant p nu. Uh, it doesn't depend on time anymore. So the left hand side will be zero. And as a consequence, the right hand side should also be zero. And we should expect um, the sum of this first term equal to the sum of this second terms here. But for simplicity, let's impose a sufficient but not necessary condition, which is called detailed balance. What we did is uh, instead of letting the sum of these terms equal to each other, we simply let these two terms equal to each other directly. So we have P sigma times W sigma to mu equal to P nu times W nu to sigma. And one of the most famous algorithm is called Metropolis algorithm. And we can cite W nu to sigma in this way. When P sigma is larger than P nu, we set it equal to one. And when P sigma is smaller than P nu, we set it to be P sigma over P nu. And we can easily verify that this algorithm satisfy this detailed balance. Okay, so after talking about the classical Monte Carlo methods, let's um, move to determinant quantum Monte Carlo method. The general ideas are um, we can do a trace of exponential of projective form of forming operators analytically if the matrix is comprised of numbers. And let's look at take a look at our host model. We are luckily since um, this term here, the forming operators are quadratic. But the problem is that the matrix in the quadratic form has phonon operators inside. So focus on this electron phonon coupling term. Besides the quadratic form for the forming operators, we also have this phonon operator xi here. So what we need to do is to get rid of this phonon operators. And Feynman has told us how to do this just by writing a path integral. Okay, let's recall a little bit the model again. So I will use H electron to represent the first two terms for electron parts. And then I will use H phonon to represent the last two terms for phonons. And finally, I will use this V to represent the electron phonon coupling term. So now let's do the calculation. So the first step is uh, just to write down the partition function as a trace of e to the negative of beta h. And what we did here is to divide beta into L terms. So beta equal to delta tau L. So we can write it in this way, the trace of e to the negative delta tau h and et cetera. We have L terms here. And then since the electron part phonon part and the electron phonon interaction part, V do not commute with each other. So we can use Chaudhary approximation. If that's why we will have this approximate, uh, equal, approximately equal sign here. So we can write it in this way. And then we just do the pass integral by inserting uh, the integral over x, uh, x1, x2 until xl. And then the trick here is to insert some identities, the sum over L, uh, XL, XL here. And one thing we need to notice is that uh, originally the V operator includes this electron phonon coupling term. It has XI, the phonon operator inside. 
But after acting on this agent state of phonon displacement operator, the, oper the X operator in V will turn into some numbers. So after writing this uh, path integral, the original 2D quantum problem will be converted to a 2 plus 1D classical problem. OK, and then we just write down uh, a few steps to do this calculation. And finally, we will have this expression. So the first part is just to give one by the phonon part. And let's use e to the negative s bosons to represent this part here. And the other part is for the uh, electron part, just the trace of uh, many matrix. So now, uh, since V doesn't have any operators after we have done this pass integral, so in the matrix, we only have numbers, and then we can do the trace over them analytically. So um, on this slide, I just uh, write out the matrix form for the Hamiltonian for both electron part, H electron, and for the electron coupling term, V part. And by using some equalities, we can write the trace of many matrix as a product of two determinants. And one is for spin up part, and the other one is for uh, spin down part. Actually, in the host model, spin up and spin down part are equivalent. I mean, actually, spin up and spin down play the same role in the, in the, in the host model. If we write out the matrix, we can also say this clearly. So the matrix for spin up and the matrix for spin down are actually um, exactly the same. So instead have a product of them, we will only have a determinant square here. So that's why we won't have any sign problems in the host model, since these blue terms should always be positive. And we can view the blue terms as the uh, probability of this configuration. And then we can uh, solve for this problem as what we did for the classical um, Monte Carlo method. Okay, so now uh, I will show you some results given by this DQMC method. So first of all is the density density correlation. And here I use the color to represent the density density correlation values. And the first line shows the density density correlation between all the size and the one in the black box here. And the second line shows the density density correlation between all the size and the one in the right box here. So um, when beta equal to two, which means at a relatively high temperature, uh, Ni and Ni plus R are independent of each other. So the average of their product should be approximately equal to the product of their average. And since we are at half billion, each of them Ni average and Ni plus R average just gives me one. So the product of them should also gives me one. So that's why at high temperature, we expect this density density correlation is around one. Like uh, in the color bar is the blue color. And as temperature is lowered, beta is increasing, we can see a CDW pattern starts to form. And at a very low temperature, beta equal to 10, we can clearly see that this is actually a one third filling CDW pattern. And what we can see here is the site in the black spot is double occupied. And also all the other, uh, this A sub lattice is also double occupied. So we have two electrons on that side and two electrons on this side. Two times two gives me four. So that's why the color is right close to four. And the second line is actually uh, the density density correlation with respect to the one in the red box. Since it is at a one third CD, uh, fading CDW pattern, the, this side here is actually vacuum. So the density density correlation between this side and all the other sides should give us zero 
because this slide is vac almost a vacuum, actually. Okay, and then uh, here is another plot given by different random uh, seed in the simulation. And this just to give us another degenerate ground state, which is corresponds to a two thirds fading CDW pattern. And the story is similar at high temperature, beta equal to two, we still expect um, the product of them should be equal to the uh, product of their average since they are independent of each other at high temperature, just to give us one. And at low temperature, for example, one beta equals to 10, we can see a two third feeling CDW pattern forms. And actually the site here in the, in the second line in the black box is double occupied. So all the other uh, BC sublites are also double occupied and that give us four uh, for this density density correlation. And the first line is with respect to the set in the left bottom corner. And this site is vacuum in this two thirds fading CDW pattern. So all the density density correlation between this site and other sites just give us almost a zero, the dark blue color. Uh, and another way to study this is by uh, looking at the electron density rho as a function of inverse temperature beta. And the results are given by several different random seed in our simulation. And we can see uh, one beta is small, so temperature is high. The density is given by um, 0.5 because we have already set mu equal to negative lambda square over omega now square. And due to the particle symmetry, it should give us half fading. As, temp uh, as temperature is lowered and beta increases uh, from around beta equal to five to beta uh, around beta equal to nine, we can see the points starts to fill in the region between the lower and the upper uh, density values. This is because um, in the course of a simulation at a finite uh, lattice and also at a finite temperature, tunneling can happen between the two minimum point, one third CW pattern or two thirds CDW pattern. So the density can take any values between one third or two thirds, uh, just depending on the relative amount of time staying at one third feeling CDW pattern or two thirds feeling CDW pattern. As temperature is further lowered and one beta is equal to 10, we can see clearly there are only two clear lines corresponding to uh, rho equal to one third and two third that corresponding to the two degenerate ground state of the system. Okay, except for that, we also um, plot density per spin rho as a function of chemical potential mu here. And we have already seen uh, similar results from earlier mean field theory results. When beta is small, that means at high temperature, the right curve is smooth. It just uh, means uh, the system transits from a vacuum to a fully occupied space. And as temperature is lowered, when beta equal to 10 in the black curve, we can see plateaus starts to form here. Uh, at rho equal to one thirds and two, two thirds. So the different, unlike other bipartite lattice, we will have a complete plateau in the middle at rho equal to 0.5. In this case, the plateau is bifurcated by an abrupt jump. That also indicates when mu is smaller than negative four, the, um, the system is at a one third feeding CW pattern. And when mu is larger than negative four, the system is at a two third failing CDW pattern. And the result is also consistent with the mean field result, mean field theory result. Okay, so finally, uh, our DQMC results also give us the 
double occupancy as a function of inverse temperature data. And uh, it is defined as average Ni up and Ni down times Ni down. And uh, similarly, when beta is small, so it means at high temperatures, we expect Ni up and Ni down are independent of each other. So each of them should give me 0.5 and the product of them should give me 0.25. So that's why uh, we have 0.25 here, sorry. And then when temperature is lowered, beta increases, we can say double occupancy increases to 0.5, which means pairs starts to form on half of the lattice size. So that's why we have a plateau here, double occupancy is around 0.5. And then similar things happens. Uh, we have many points just to fill in the region between the lower and upper bound, just because tunneling happens during this simulation. And finally, when beta equals to 10, very low temperature, we can see clearly um, on size A and on size BC, the double occupancy can be either zero or one corresponding to the one third feeding CDW pattern and two thirds feeding CDW pattern. And here is a dashed line uh, indicating the critical temperature is given is 6.4. Uh, this result is given by a more careful finite size scaling, and I will talk about this soon. And also from such a plot, even though we cannot tell the beta critical accurately from such a plot, but we still can estimate uh, beta critical is around this region, around beta equal to six. So these results are also consistent with each other. Yes, so finally, uh, we just uh, use a more accurate way to determine the critical temperature. And here we define a CDW structure factor and N is the um, total number of the size. And here is just the, the sum of density density correlation. So actually this CDW structure factor is a fair transform of density density correlation. And since at low temperatures, there are two degenerate ground state, one third filling CDW pattern to third filling CDW pattern, it breaks, breaks a Z2 symmetry. So it is in the 2D Ising universality class, and we can directly use the known um, 2D Ising universality class critical exponents, beta equal to one over eight, mu equal to one, and to do this finite size scaling. And then we will see SCDW should be proportional to L to the power of seven over four times some function uh, of T times L. Uh, here L is just the lightest size and T is actually the reduced temperature T minus TC or TC. So in this plot, we can clearly see um, SCDW over L to the power of seven over four is plotted as a function of beta for several different lightest sizes. And we can clearly see a crossing at around beta C equal to 6.4. And also another way to do this is plot this quantity as a function of beta minus beta C times L. And we can see a perfect data collapse here. So that also indicates um, beta C is around 6.4. And we just uh, follow the same steps to determine the um, critical temperatures. So finally, we get a phase diagram for our lead lattice. And we also show uh, Tc as a function of lambda d. Lambda d is uh, the dimensionless coupling constant for other geometries, including honeycomb and the square lattice. So um, at a first glance, we might feel very surprised that the lead lattice and honeycomb lattice values are so close to each other. But um, people might argue that they are actually totally different since in honeycomb lattice, when it's at half filling case, we have direct coins 
uh, like the density of state at E equal to zero point, the density of space is also zero. But in the leave light his case is totally different. As I showed you at the beginning of the talk, the density of space at E equal to zero point will be a delta function. But uh, I think it, it is also kind of understandable because um, actually in the light is a dough we set mu equal to negative lambda square over omega naught square corresponding to the half fitting case. But actually it happens when rho equal to one third or rho equal to two thirds. So actually on the left hand side of the delta function and on the right hand side of the delta function. And in that region, it is very similar to the uh, Dirac point of the honeycomb lattice. Then the only difference between lib lattice and honeycomb lattice is the only the coordination number. And we know in honeycomb lattice, each side has three nearest neighbors. So Z equal to three. And for lib lattice, we can also calculate the coordination number. Two thirds of the size have two nearest neighbors. And the other one third of the size have four nearest neighbors. So on average, the coordination number is eight over three. So this eight over three is also very close to the coordination number for honeycomb lattice, z equal to three. Then um, we might feel not so surprising that lib lattice and honeycomb lattice PC values are so close to each other. Yeah, so uh, that's basically my today's talk. And finally, it's just uh, some conclusions. To sum up, uh, we have studied the charge density wave transition for the host model on the lip lattice. And our interest was in studying the effect of light bands on the uh, ordered phase driven by electron phonon interaction. And then um, the behaviors of the electron density, double occupancy, and charge structure factor have been obtained quantitatively and used to infer a phase diagram of critical temperature versus um, coupling constant. And uh, last but not least, I also want to emphasize that uh, although at anti-adiabatic limit, our host model is equivalent with the attractive Hubbard model. But since at finite omega case, host model breaks the spin symmetry with CBW order dominating over the superconductivity order. So um, in, the, in the host model, CBW transitions happens at finite temperatures. While in the Hubbard model, it only happens, the transition only happens at T equal to zero. So our host model is different from uh, attractive Hubbard in such a fundamental way. Yeah, so that's basically my talk for today. And thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chun Han, for this uh, wonderful talk. Let's thank uh, Chun Han. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, um, so um, yeah, uh, so now we have uh, time for questions. Um, so Sung Jong uh, already wrote, uh, so please Sung Jong. Uh, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I have a question on page 10. Mm -hmm. can, can I see that? So let's go back to page 10. Um, I mean, when when you, like the include the the interact uh, the the coupling between phonon and uh, the electron motion. I think uh, you use the uh, spe specific onsets for phonon mode, and uh, like I guess I mean that specification of the phonon mode uh, has some effect on the charge density wave for the electron part. I mean, if I understand properly, so I'm I'm wondering if there's any justification of uh, this specific phono mode that interact with the electron? Oh, you mean yeah. use the some questions about using this on size or? Yes, yes, the the phono part. So I mean, th this the the answers for the phono for this. I mean, uh, 
and that's for the phonon, it implies that uh, so like the electrons are mainly interact with specific phonon mode, right? Yes, so actually if we use this n size and because in the Hamiltonian here, we actually have the term lambda xi times r. This is actually the density operator ni. And actually lambda xi can be viewed as a chemical potential acting on site i. So um, the uh, non-zero bond demorization delta also implies a staggered pattern of electron density, which is uh, the CDW phase. Uh, so my question is like that staggered form of the I mean, delta, mm -hmm. does it, it, it should affect the electron, I mean, it should affect, it should have some, um, how can I say? Um, so CDW is excited due to this staggered phonon, uh, I, the interaction with the staggered phonon mode, right? So if, if you, if you, gen, if you general, I mean, if you include all the generalized phonon mode, does it still like uh, make the system have, um, what is it, the, uh, the charge density wave like this? Yeah, so yeah, I think you are right. The charge density wave will um, have we will have such a pattern. And as is shown in this plot here, and we can see one T is larger than this TC, the delta star is actually zero. So the, it, the delta star is zero. It also means the density is uniform. And if delta star is non-zero, it all, then also suggests the electron density is not uniform, have a staggered pattern. And that is the CDW phase. I see. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we probably can discuss a little bit more later. Yeah, yeah thank you for the question. Okay, um, we have enough time for other questions. Um, so since I don't see any raised hands, let me uh, start maybe. So uh, basically, uh, you see that uh, Monte, uh, sorry, that uh, mean field is actually works very well, right? So basically, the difference is just uh, the critical temperature uh, kind yeah. of, mm -hmm. um, so. but, but uh, kind of the behavior is captured, right? Um, yes, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, the nice thing is that uh, determinant quantum QMC, right, gives you uh, critical exponents. I mean, you get the scaling, so you really yeah. show that, that uh, it's the uh, 2D Ising class, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, maybe a question, so uh, what would you expect uh, then for other uh, flat band models like uh, DICE or Kagome if we stay in 2D, uh, for example? Um, uh -huh. Could you say uh, something or? Mm, I think the other flat band models is also very interesting and I'm probably do not have a very direct feeling uh, to say what will happen in other flight bands. And also uh, our group is also studying uh, this host model on other uh, lattice also including flight bands. Um, for example, I think because for this, um, for this lead lattice geometry, it is like this. And if we have a CDW pattern, uh, we can think about is reasonable that it has one third or two thirds fading CDW pattern. But for other geometries, if it includes flight bands, I think it also depends on the geometry itself. It probably be more complicated. Yeah, but I'm not mm -hmm. have a finite, have a final conclusion about this. Yeah, I think it's also very interesting problems and um, deserve to have some simulations for those problems too. Yeah. Thank you for the mm -hmm. question. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Sergey. Yeah, I have a follow up uh, on uh, Tilan's uh, question. So, what uh, what do you think will happen if you uh, if you get your flat band away from the dispersive bands? Uh, in your case, the flat band is sitting at energy zero, uh, and there are these conical intersection points. Uh, you could, in principle, easily uh, 
perturb your deep web is such that you preserve even uh, all the symmetries, but such that you will uh, open um, a gap uh, between the discursive band and the flat band. That is question one. What what would what is your intuition telling you? Uh, what will happen with your uh, results, in particular with your transition points, and maybe the charge density wave properties? And the other question related to that is, or second question is, what do you expect will happen if you place your flat band at the very bottom of your the single particle spectrum? Right now it's somewhere sitting in the middle, but let's say we put it into uh, like in the Kagome uh, lattice. We put it into the. Uh, it will be located at the. It will be the ground state, or so to say, of the single particle uh, eigenvalue problem. What would be, uh, be then your prediction or expectation? Mm, thank you for the question. So, for other uh, systems, like for example, for uh, Kagome lattice, I think. Um, is uh, a frustrated system. So unlike uh, square lattice or honeycomb lattice or this lib lattice, we will have uh, a perfect CDW pattern is zero, double occupied, such things. Um, but in other um, triangular or um, Kegelme lattice, we, we have a, a triangular there and maybe just a one third of them can be double occupied and the other uh, size should be uh, vacuum and or yeah or the in inverse thing and also uh, I think so in this case in square lattice or honeycomb lattice we always focus on the half fitting case because uh, if we have a very perfect CBW pattern we expect to see a very good pattern at half fitting but for other geometries. Uh, like you proposed, that maybe for a triangular Kagome like this, et cetera, uh, the situation might be different. So we might should also see uh, how it changes when we change the chemical potential and see the electron density, maybe at one third feeding or two third feeding cases like that. But um, I didn't have a final conclusion about what really will happen for those two cases. Mm -hmm. And but uh, sure, thanks. But uh, could you again then comment what would be your what what will be your expectation if you just stay with the leap, but you perturb it such that you open the gap in between the two dispersive bands and the flat band? Is there any will that gap have any impact on your or modify your results? Uh, you mean so you can stay at half you just do everything you did, but you you have a different. A uh, single particle spectrum, which we will now have a gap. Uh, so actually, I, I didn't hear you very clearly. So the question is. Um, well, imagine you take this, this, this uh, single particle spectrum, which you show here in the bottom right figure, and uh, uh -huh. but now you open a gap uh, around the flat band. So the two dispersive bands do not touch the flat band, but uh, stay at a finer distance away from it. We will call this distance gap. Uh -huh. uh, how does this non-zero gap uh, impact your results? A non-zero gap. Mm -hmm. Is there any anything you can say? So, I guess it might uh, not in influence my result uh, quite a bit. I um, because. So actually, in this model, even though uh, we set mu equal to negative lambda square over omega naught square and corresponds to the half fitting case due to the particle hole symmetry, um, but it really happens, the CDW pattern really happens at rho equal to one third, so below the flight band, or rho equal to two thirds, um, uh, uh, I mean, above the flight band. So I think if there is a gap between the point and this two point doesn't touch each other, it might also be the case like what I see here. Yeah, that's, that's my guess. And I think um, another thing I also want to explain a little bit more is that 
uh, in this project, uh, there is some analogies to the magnetic model. For example, Ising model, uh, when there is no external magnetic field. Uh, because in Ising model, when there is no external magnetic field, it, we expect the magnetization m equal to zero for that case. And mm -hmm. just like in, in our case, when t is larger than tc, we have half feeling uh, for the, uh, when temperature is high uh, for this system, when mu is said to be negative lambda square over omega naught square. But when T is lower than Tc, as we can see in the Ising model, uh, even though due to the symmetry, we expect magnetization to be zero, but actually there are two ground state um, for the Ising model when T is smaller than Tc, with uh, magnetization either be positive or negative. So the analogy is that in this case, um, the electron density is just a, like the magnetization can be one third or two third, but on average it's still half feeling. Yeah, so that's my uh, additional explanation for this point. And yeah, I think if I have a gap in the middle, we probably can see some similar things. Yeah, but it also diverse some other simulations to verify this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have any further uh, questions or comments? Um, Alexei, please. Yeah, thanks. I, I have a rather technical question. So when you're doing the min field, you assume the charge density wave ends up. Or, uh, yes. Uh, well, I guess you had an intuition that you should see this state, but did you consider a case, technically you can just, um, in, in this min field approximation, you end up with a free energy as a, Function of the many uh, of the x uh, of the x zero of well the positions of the phonons. Uh -huh. So technically, you could try mini well optimizing the free energy with respect to the phonon positions and see what you get. Um, did you consider that? I mean, even yeah, though my so... guess is you you would still see the charge density wave, but I'm still curious what what would that optimization bring. So what I did here is um, the free energy is actually a function of X naught, delta, and beta. And so what I did is for a fixed beta, for a fixed temperature, and view it as a function of X naught and delta. And I find the, the X naught star and delta star by minimizing the free energy. Yeah, no, no, right, but you, I mean, to get this free energy, you already assume that you um, that you have a specific pattern of the um, atoms of the um, of the sites displacement. So that uh, some sites are displayed with x zero plus delta, some with x zero minus delta. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. What What I'm saying is, uh, you make uh, the same. Well, you have in this slide the the, the ansatz. So you replace operators by just numbers. But you assume that these numbers basically are x naught plus minus delta. What I'm talking about is you just assume that your operators becomes numbers. So in a sense, uh, I wonder what happened if you don't make that answers. You simply say that x i, the operator, is replaced by x zero plus delta, but delta is now site dependent, and then you optimize the free energy to see what is the best uh, what is the best state. Oh, uh, so you mean? Instead of lighting x naught and delta being numbers, we still have some. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, you, you take them numbers, but you allow them to be site dependent. Essentially, you make no assumption you should see a charge density wave. Uh -huh. uh, I see I'm your curious, point. I'm curious, well, I'm, I'm basically curious whether you would that would emerge automatically by minimizing well, uh, minimizing the free energy or. Um, you would get stuck because uh, there's a lot of local meaning or, or um, um, essentially what was your intuition to, to look for specifically for the charge density wave? So basically the uh, reason that we look for charge density wave is because uh, we have studied this model on, on square lattice and honeycomb lattice. And as we discussed at the beginning, uh, because we have this uh, 
uh, electron phonon coupling term, and it's actually in antiadiabatic limit, it is an attractive electron electron interaction. So that will give rise to a charge density wave. And then, so in the mean field theory, we just assume Xi uh, using this on size also have such a staggered pattern. And due to the uh, symmetry of the uh, of the lattice of the geometry, the sub lattice mm -hmm. A have the same. Mm -hmm. I understand. Same. I mean, well, once you assume that it's, it's probably charge density wave, then I guess the symmetry of the lattice uh, enforces how the answer seems like. Um, that, that basically that, that brings me to the next question. So maybe I missed that, but so what, what's the difference of the leaf case with respect to the square and honeycomb case? What's the difference between flat band and no flat band? So um, basically, the different thing is. Um, in this case, even though we set mu equal to negative lambda square or omega null square, as the result is shown here, we when temperature is lower than the critical temperature, we uh, we will see actually the density is one third or two third corresponding to the two degenerate ground state, and just uh, like uh, the analogies to the Ising model. When T is smaller than Tc, we can see the magnetization can be either positive or negative. But for the square lattice or honeycomb lattice, if we simply set mu equals to this value, negative lambda square over omega null square, what we will see is that the that if we just simply look at the density, the, there isn't a such um, pattern here. The density should always be 0.5. So, I mean, you're saying that since in, in the square lattice and honeycomb, there's no, there's no transition. There's no Sorry, I didn't both. both. For, the, for, the square, for the square lattice and the honeycomb, there's no transition. Do I get it correct? Uh, there, there is transition, but we cannot examine this transition by looking at density. Um, we can see the transition by looking at other quantities. For example, we can look at density-density uh, density correlation. So for a square lattice, we will also have such a pattern. The size is double occupied, and its nearest the neighbor is vacuum, and its neighbor is double occupied. We can still see this in the square lattice or honeycomb lattice. And also similarly for the double occupancy, uh, instead of seeing the uh, the two lines, two structure here to be zero or one in honeycomb or square or square lattice, we will only see uh, it increases first since uh, at high temperature it they are independent, give us 0.25, and then as temperature is lowered, uh, pairs starts to form and the CDW pattern starts to form. So it will always stay at this 0.5 uh, point for the double occupancy for square and honeycomb lattice. Uh, yeah, but if we look at this um, charge density density correlation, we can still see such a pattern in honeycomb and square lattice. But the only different thing is we cannot see such a signal uh, in the electron density. We, we won't see one third or two third fitting case, but it should always be half fitting for the Honeycomb or square lattice. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you again, uh, Chun Han. Uh, it was a really interesting talk. And let's thank her again. Thank you very much. Uh, and with this, we uh, conclude today's uh, seminar.